this name because you'll need to refer to it later. Uh, Ed is the deaf traveler as a blog with social media platforms that he founded and which is designed to inspire, support, and provide fellow deaf people to travel. He's profoundly deaf in both ears and throughout his solo travels in the last eight years, he has noticed a keen interest from other travelers about his deafness and how his deafness influences his traveling experiences. He often tells his story to many people, destroying stereotypes, discrimination, and raising awareness of the, how they can support deaf travelers. Also throughout his travels, he has received many emails and messages from many deaf people from across the globe asking for advice and inspiration about how they can travel solo themselves. He's currently working as a digital marketing manager for a children's charity called Sailors Children's Society, giving financial, practical and emotional support to seafaring families from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's a six month contract and he plans to start working full time in the travel market after Christmas, I guess, after Christmas, advocating deaf awareness. So we can look forward to the deaf traveler being an ambassador for the travel community, travel brands, travel companies and transport networks to support deaf travelers traveling around the world. Closer to me, we have Sassi, who I met at a conference in Italy, in Trentino back in June. Uh, first time I met her, and she spoke brilliantly on the stage in the closing session up at, uh, in Italy. So very, very pleased to have her with us today. Sassi is a disability blogger, journalist, and speaker. She challenges perceptions through education and humor, empowering others to be more disability confident. Working with charities, papers, brands, tourism boards in the last five years, she's battled misconceptions, those stereotypes, and proven that disability doesn't hold you back. She believes that if society has an open mind and truly wants to be inclusive and accessible as possible, travel, tourism, and transport is where we need to start. Disabled people, this is a quote, can help to pave the way to reduce societal barriers and expectations. We just need to be at the forefront of those discussions. Sassi is joined today by her faithful hound Ida, who is also on stage in Italy. It's incredibly well behaved and you can be as soppy as you like with Ida, because she deserves it. <laughs> Round of applause please for Sassi and Ed. Sassi, was well, that a fair introduction to you? Have you changed your opinions and views? Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not fishing for compliments. It was, <laughs> if you were going to do your mission statement, would it be about trying to change expectations and barriers? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's the, the biggest barrier we face is, is judgment and societal issues rather than the fact that buildings can be made accessible and transport can be made accessible, tourism can be made accessible. We just need to start with the people who pay the money. Okay, how do we do that? How what's your approach? I think they, I feel that we need to employ people like ourselves, those with disabilities who are at the forefront, um, speaking candidly about their thoughts and opinions. I am one blind person, I may not speak for the entire blind community, but I would rather be one voice in a sea rather than being no voices and there being absolutely zero representation. Um, for me as well, I'm totally blind because of chronic illness and so I was in a wheelchair for about eight years of my life, so I'm passionate about making sure everything's accessible to all. Are you, are you one voice in the wilderness or is there an increasing clamour? I feel like there really is an increasing, increasing clamour. I feel like so many people with disabilities, whether they're travellers or just disability bloggers, uh, journalists, speakers, all up and down the UK especially, are really changing the landscape and putting forward to the industries why discussions need to be had and why we need to be employed to help change the landscape. Okay. Um, you're aware of the tourism sector report which is coming out in detail in 2020? Yes. Um, I don't know if anybody, the government has given a deal to the tourism sector for the first time ever to actually respect it and recognise it as an industry as opposed to a nice bit of frippery around the side. And one of these conditions of giving this money out is improved accessibility uh, throughout the country, making it a serious issue and proposition mm -hmm. with the aim of increasing 
dis people with disabilities coming into the country from other countries to increase it by 25% over five years. And that means not just making sure there's a handrail, but it's it's actually changing your outlook, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's about changing attitudes and perceptions more than anything. Um, I am quite happy to discuss with people on the street why I'm visually impaired and why I need a guide dog and how she helps me. But at the end of the day, we need the people who have got real influence, as in the people with the money, people in government, to take a stand and stand alongside us and actually share that and say that we are one, not just one voice trying to shout into the crowd. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Ed, um, I've given you an introduction. To help you know Ed a bit better, because he's quite a name in the travel industry blogging scene, I'd like to play a short video, which Ed did for the BBC. I think you know I was going to show this, but he did know very long ago, so it might be a bit of a surprise. But if we can roll the video, this is Ed working with the BBC to raise awareness of how to handle or to respect deaf people. Here we go. How in public, everyone else doesn't need to know about your death. Guys, just let you all know, Ed's deaf. Big deal about it. Just... You can drive. Our feet and eyes work. Ed, thank you so much for agreeing to look after my cat. No problem. Make sure you let her off because you have to run around yeah. the way. Basically. And when you bring her in, you can stroke her. Never. <laughs> Don't cover your mouth. We need to lick free. Yeah, so make sure that you give her a drop. Don't wear sunglasses. Right. We need eye contact. Got it all? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Hi there, how can I help you? I'm here for you, John Snow. Um, just to let you know that I'm deaf. You, you're what, sorry? Deaf. Please, don't freak out. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give them... Please, don't talk like that. Just be normal. Every deaf person is different. Everyone is unique. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. No questions is stupid. Great. Top man. <laughs> hey, not a bad introduction. Did you get much reaction to that film? I, um, I really did, actually. I wasn't really expecting to have a huge reaction because it's with a local BBC company. And I thought I'd probably get some support and response from the local community. Yeah. Um, but then all of a sudden I started getting messages from like, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Japan, America, everywhere. And so far, one video alone that's been shared, it's been about 45,000 views. Wow. And, so, and it's still increasing and increasing. And I keep going back to BBC and just keep saying, you really ought to um, employ me as a advocate, really. So, yeah. So that's been really good. But yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic. Still, actually, they have a disabilities correspondent, don't they? Yes. Frank Gardner. And the, yes. Yeah. yeah. So you better watch out. <laughs> so. Are there any chance of you doing more films, more educational films like that? Well, what's this space? We're going to have a Deaf Awareness Week uh, next year in May, so we might be having a few more videos, potentially. Yeah. Great. You covered a lot of points there about yes. tips for people, you know, talk at you, don't cover your mouth. Is there anything else you'd like to say on top of that that you, yes, you uh, didn't cover in that video? Yeah, so it's all about um, writing as well. So you've got to make sure that um, there's some enough white light on your face here to work to lick what you And uh, But also not to stand in front of a window because if you stand in front of a window, you can actually darken your features and you can't actually see um, your lips at all to liquid. And uh, But also um, the biggest thing for me is if we ask you to repeat something and then you say, oh, don't worry, it doesn't matter, that's the worst thing to say to a deaf person. Take your time, repeat it, you still don't understand it, just say it differently, in a different way. We'll get there, we'll understand it. What we want to be is be included in the conversation with you and be part of 
part of the experience as well. Okay, so both of you, when you are traveling, Ed, you are profoundly deaf, as we said. You've had a, a cochlear implant. Can you yes. tell us a bit about that, but also when you are traveling, what issues you have and your practical gear and having to look after that? And um, yeah, so um, I have to carry the equipment and water the suit to carry equipment for my hearing aid and my cochlear implant, just in case it might break, it could go missing, it get lost, whatever. So some of them could be um, batteries um, that I just need to change about every week or so. Um, some of them could be sleeves, like I'm wearing here on my hearing aid, um, to stop everything getting wet if I'm caught out in the rain. Or like, you know, when I was running from the train station to from here today, um, I've got sweating a lot. Um, so it doesn't make bricks and everything. And, uh, but also there's some cleaning materials as well to keep, make sure that my email is kept nice and clean. Both if I go to humid countries, it's very easy to get wet. So you could actually have a drying box, a special drying box to make sure that your hearing aids are kept nice and cool for the next day while you're back to sleep. But uh, my favourite one is the vibrating alarm clock. Oh, right, brilliant. Yes, um, I sometimes describe it with a passion, especially if you've been out the night before. Um, but it's a device you put under your pillow and then it takes up the time you want to wake up but it feels like the whole world is vibrating and you have to try and get you out of bed. So if you have trouble waking up, buy one of these, you'll be out of bed, no problem. That's, that's a really good tip. I'd, so, <laughs> I don't like waking up, but if that's going off under your ear, that would be very useful. <laughs> uh, that's actually, I also know that the rapid change in technology is helping you travel as well in so many ways, isn't it? Yeah. Primarily through the phone, of course. Yeah, so um, the fantastic thing is, as you said, technology is really, truly advanced, which means I can use a phone just like you guys can, and I use a multitude of apps. I remember when I went to Rotterdam, Uber was my lifesaver, and it might be an app that everyday people use, but the fact that they've built in accessibility yes. means that I, as a totally blind person, can use it, and I can be independent. I use everything like Google Maps, Apple Maps, um, but there's other apps that I use uh, called um, Soundscape, and it's made by Microsoft, and it gives you uh, verbal communication using a clock system of where you are, what's around you, and uh, what street you're on, those sorts of things. And I know Google Maps does it, but it's very accurate in comparison to Google Maps. You could be about a meter or two out. Okay. Whereas with Soundscape, it literally will, ex will explain to you you're coming to an interchange, you're coming to a crossing. And if you're traversing somewhere completely new, that's just brilliant for me yeah. because I can use Ida and she knows to stop at curbs and wait for the command to go. But if we're both just adventuring together, then she might think, oh, I'll keep going. <laughs> so it's great to let me know what's around me. Um, and then I just use, you know, social media, just like everyone else. And if I need to, I'll FaceTime someone and be like, where am I? Yeah. <laughs> so the power of technology has really allowed me to travel and be independent whilst I travel. Excellent. Can you just explain a bit more about how does Google Maps help you? Do you have any sight at all? No, no I okay. don't. I was born totally sighted. Um, very long story short, I broke my arm at the age of seven and had arthritis. From there, realized it's hereditary and arthritis can go to your eyes. So I started getting sight problems around the age of 14, but I didn't go totally blind until I was 23 and I'm almost 29. So since six years now, I've had zero vision whatsoever. Um, so I've kind of gone through each stage of having sight, knowing what I'm losing, being in a area where I've got blurred vision but still can't really see very much and then now having nothing um, and for me it is really difficult I believe like communicating especially in bit busy environments like this yes. but actually for me in my eye condition specifically I was having a lot of eye pain and a lot of eye trouble and I couldn't concentrate to, to get around so I lost a lot of independence and confidence and now being totally blind there's nothing stopping me Brilliant. so I use Google Maps um, again to, to check my location to make sure I'm in the right area um, as I said it, it is great but as I'm totally blind sometimes <laughs> I remember one time I was I was trying to do a new route I was just like okay I'm gonna go wandering off and I literally was walking around someone's front garden for about 10 minutes because it kept saying turn left so I turned left and I'd hit a wall and I was like turn left so I turned left and hit that front door 
Chandler and I would go round and round and round this person's garden until I just thought, do you know what, screw this and I just kept walking back and then I eventually found, like I had to walk over their grass and everything to figure yeah. out but that's what I mean, whereas with Microsoft it'll say, you're out number 21 drive and I'm like, oh, oh gosh, I'm in someone's garden Hi <laughs> So these are sound apps, effectively, mapping sound apps. Yeah. Soundscape, I don't know, Google Maps I can get. Yeah. Are there, what else do you use on a, on a phone which is of tremendous value to you? Or what do you need, if you like? Um, so for me, I, I need the ability for apps and websites to be accessible. I need buttons and links to be labeled. I need old text descriptions, which is photo descriptions and explaining what's in a photo, who's in a photo, and what, where we are, yes. um, and I just, I, I just need people more than anything to, if they, if they want to be inclusive and they don't realise, ask people in the community yes. because, I, as I said, I'm one voice. I don't try and speak for everyone. I just try and explain my perspective. Yeah. But I do on my own blog have like handy tips of how you can make Facebook more accessible, how you can make Pinterest, Instagram, all those other things. And these are the apps that blind people use just like you. Um, and they have inbuilt accessibility because their developers have made it so. <coughs> Instagram, not as much. Yeah. Um, but the fact that even 2010 and before, you didn't have a talking phone. And you didn't have the internet and a talking phone. So you'd have to use a computer. And that means learning how to use a laptop, how to use keyboard shortcuts. Whereas with a, a phone that's touch screen, you're just like everyone else. And I, I use everything like everyone else. I think one or two apps I might use are um, Move It, which is um, a bus app. But again, that was made accessible, but it isn't actually for blind people. Oh. It's, it's an app for people to find out where their nearest bus is and it will even give you alerts to let you know when you're coming to your stop and when to get off. So as a blind person, if I'm doing a new route, that's perfect. It means I don't have to take someone sighted. I can rely on myself and the driver. And, and this, this constant development, which is to your advantage, it's not by luck, is it? Presumably these people are being taught that this is what's required. Yeah, there's, there's what, what we kind of joke about in the disability community is that um, able-bodied people made things because disabled people asked them to and that's why we've got the technology we have because we've been beating down doors and shouting about it for years and years and years but now it's really coming to the forefront that yes accessibility is key accessibility is key to communication and if you think about it from a standpoint of tourism um, lots of disabled people want to travel there's 14 million people in the UK alone uh, that are registered with a disability, that's just registered with, we're not counting the ones that aren't, and we have a spending power of £249 billion. Pounds in this the is UK. the purple pound. Yes, this yes. is the purple pound. And so when you put that into consideration of making an app accessible, making your restaurant accessible, making, um, you know, making sure that you have disability awareness and equality, it makes the transition not only smoother, but it makes businesses run. Yeah. Now, since I heard Sassy talk in June, I have conscientiously, when I'm doing my posts, put alt text in, which I never bothered about before. And I'm sure a lot of you, hands up, who don't do that when they're doing, putting something on your site or on your blogs. There's quite a few people here who are guilty of that, which you won't do anymore, clearly. <laughs> alt text you can then see or hear or read and understand. It's very important. That's your number one tip, I think, alt text. Uh, yeah, absolutely, alt text. And especially if you're a, a blogger and you're using your blog to create a custom or an audience and then revenue, if you do fantastic alt text, SEO loves you for it too. Oh. So you get ranked even higher in even the algorithm. Better. Ed, uh, your wraps. We're talking about development of technology, improving things for yourselves all the time. Would, would you agree with this and what do you use? I definitely, yeah. I definitely use Google Maps as well. Um, yeah. Particularly if I'm uncomfortable asking someone for directions, even if they get told to me about what I'm not quite sure. So I will use uh, the Google Maps uh, to get me from A to B. And also use Google Translate as well. And yeah. so somebody can speak into the uh, phone and then read it out for me so I can read it. 
um, I can type it out again and then it correctly pronounce it and hopefully it does, does that. Yeah. Um, but I actually got told about this um, halfway through a demonstration to somebody to ask where the uh, bathroom is. Yeah. Uh, so I said, why don't you see Google uh, Translate? And I thought, that's fantastic. So it's been a really key thing for me. But um, getting real-time information about a journey is also really key. So, yeah. for example, like today, um, so I was caught up in an incident down the train line. Um, the tannoy was going up on the train, but I could not hear a thing that was being said. And until um, an app actually alerted to me, say, you know, it's going to, it's going to be delayed for about two hours, you know, might want to consider going and make an alternative arrangement for here, and that went that way. So it kind of gave me less stress and less worry to think about it, but also just a, a way to communicate with someone as well without having to ring someone yeah. or trying to find someone. Um, but in interesting you mentioned rail because you did a, an exercise recently, hashtag making rail accessible. Yeah. And you went on a journey, well, not a journey in life, but a journey on a train. Yes. Pointing out, uh, well, I think you've got five or six points I've got down here. So could you just talk us through two or three of the main points that you yes. just hit you, which are obvious things to do, which are not being done? Yeah. So this is very quite consistent throughout um, the journeys I've gone through. So the first one is um, people got to realise there's a spectrum of deafness. You have people who use British Sign Language or any form of Sign Language, and then you've got the one on the other side, you've just got hard of hearing people and they struggle just to catch things. So one of those, you no know, one solution that fits all. Um, so one of the consistent things I've found was having an induction loop um, in the station. So basically anyone with a hearing aid or a cooling plant can um, put themselves on the setting and um, they'll be able to hear a uh, a frequency that I'm able to hear the speaker talk to you, particularly on ticket offices or um, in help points or something. But yes, they may have installed it, but they haven't actually switched it on, or they haven't given the staff the training to use it basically. So it's always 90% of the time turned off or not working. And the second one is um, deaf awareness. Well, because um, got to, like I said on this video, you know, making sure you're facing them properly. Simple communication tips that can go a long way. Um, that needs to be delivered to the staff. And um, looking through the guidelines of every single train company or network rail or something uh, they have for making rail accessible, then just deliver a two-hour disability awareness training. Yeah. To try and cover all disabilities. So I imagine perhaps in their deaf awareness would be five minutes done just to go to met the requirements. Um, so that's what's something that needs to be worked on. Yeah, that's yeah. good stuff. This is, Sassy mentioned the purple pounds, worth 250 billion uh, in the UK economy, because it's not just yourselves, it's family, friends as well, traveling with you. Uh, interestingly, disabled wheelchair users only make up 4% of the purple pound. I think it's 12% uh, with learning difficulties, mental illness, 47% people with long-term illness, dietary requirements, all these sort of disabilities need to be recognised individually as well, not just lumped in together, don't they? So what you're referring to in terms of apps, how you're able to use it, how you're able to use laptops with readable screens, this is important, but do you get the sense that your disability are being treated individually or is it still too much under one umbrella? And for example, use the example I said earlier on, you just put an induction loop in, don't get the training, but don't know how to use it, but it's a tick box exercise. Yeah. And that's what happens um, quite a lot these days. But, um, as I said earlier on, is things are changing now, so people are wanting to make things inclusive. Um, but we need to be at a better, more advanced rate than it is what it currently is at the moment. Yeah. Um, Sassy, what do you say? Yeah, I, I agree. I think we unfortunately all get lumped into this one category, this one umbrella. Um, you know, for someone like myself, if it's a busy environment like this, I might need sighted guiding and people don't know what that is. And it's simply me taking your elbow and being one pace behind you so that when you're walking, I can feel through your body movements, which way you're turning. I would appreciate if you told me left and right, and I would also appreciate if you told me you were coming up to a step. 
but that simple gesture of me just following your body yeah. movements makes a whole lot of difference and people do not know that that's A, a thing or B, how to do it because I get grabbed, pushed, pulled. I know when I was a wheelchair user and I'm sure the wheelchair users in the audience can also agree, people put their hands on you and your mobility aid constantly and they just don't get that we're human beings. It's like there's this weird barrier of it's okay to grab you because a, I don't know how to communicate effectively with you, therefore I'm not going to take the time to try to yeah. and ask you what you need. So I'm just going to assume and then that's when, in my case, I stand up for myself and I'm assertive and I ask, please take your hands off me. And then I get told I'm rude. And, and it just takes simple communication. I think, you know, it is literally the saying, just ask. Yes. Don't grab me, just ask. And, and that way... You know, whether you're a wheelchair user, whether you're hearing impaired, whether you're visually impaired, whether you have um, any sort of disability that's visible to the eye, yeah. you just appreciate that it's about communication. Uh, and on that point, within the whole figure as well, 70% of people with disabilities have invisible disabilities. So it's that understanding. It's not about a hotel, I hope, just doing, oh, we'd better put a ramp in, we'd better put a rail in and thinking we've done it. It's, it's, it's also treating you with a big smile, whatever disability, yeah. and saying really enjoy yourself, not just making sure you're okay. Yeah, certainly, I, I agree. And putting, pressing on Ed's point about the Equality Act, there is a quote that says, reasonable adjustments. Well, what does that mean? Because what a reasonable adjustment is to a wheelchair user is so different to what someone who's hearing impaired and needs a hearing loop, to someone who's visually impaired and needs a rail menu. Yeah. And yet, People in the industry and in tourism think that they've ticked all the boxes by putting a handrail in a bathroom, but what they haven't done is measured the width of the, the toilet and the space it takes for the wheelchair user to actually transfer. Exactly. So when you you and Ed and your mates in the wheelchair away, when are you going to form a hit team? So hit going to the hotel and say, right, you haven't done this, this and this and isn't that something you should be working together as I, joint? I definitely agree. There are um, organisations out there. I'm actually part of the campaign at the moment, um, which is about tourism and inclusivity for all, especially is across the hotel. Is that tourism for all? Uh, yes, but that's not the one I'm in. Okay. Um, tourism for all is great, though. Yeah. Um, absolutely recommend it. But um, it's, it's about access for all people's needs, and they have created... Um, guides and everything so we have meetings like every month and we go into different hotels or whatnot and I remember one hotel they've done is um, for those that need um, hoisting kits to either go to the bathroom or get transferred in and out of bed instead of just making it ugly and medical they made it blend in with the room and then they gave a, a guide to the room for a layout for visually impaired people and then they said there's um, a flashing um, light on the phone if the phone's ringing in the hotel for um, those with hearing impairments. But uh, also to go back to your point about 70% of people um, with disabilities have invisible disabilities, I absolutely agree because before I started using mobility aids such as a wheelchair or, or a guide dog or a cane, I, no one knew I had a visual, I had a disability. They only knew because I told them. They only said, oh, I didn't really, or they saw me looking closely at my phone. But when someone has dietary requirements, you can't just pass it off and say, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because that could really make a person ill or seriously ill to the point of death. So you need to take it seriously when people say, sorry, I'm gluten intolerant. Mm -hmm. Now we could carry on again for hours. <laughs> Sassy has another appointment. However, surely there must be a couple of questions we can put to our couple here. Great sense of knowledge. I know a lot of people want to talk to you individually afterwards. Is there any questions from the audience we'd like? Okay, you are going to get to talk to these guys individually. I thank you very much for your time today. Thank and for you, Ed and for Sassy, please put your hands together and say thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I'm very aware that you...